Um, so first of all, um, just before jumping into some of the actual content, um, it's worth um, a quick slide on who we are as a company. Um, so you've heard my bio there from Oliver, um, but Avolution really is the supplier of the um, Abacus EA tool. Um, so we're a leader in this particular market. Um, and we have users all across the world, across many different countries. And therefore, we also have offices around the world to support our users as well. You can see that we've been doing this for, for a number of different years now. Um, so a few years, so I've been here for close to 10 of those 21 years. Um, and certainly one of the things you'll see on here as well at the bottom is the support that we have for the different types of frameworks, um, notations, methodologies, all of those kind of um, accelerators, if you like, that can help various enterprise architects to build content within their EA tools. <clears throat> The TOGAF um, standard 10th edition of the course is what we'll be focusing on today, um, but we will touch partly on some of the other notations and frameworks as well. Um, just give you a bit of an idea of how that's going to be supported um, in the tool. So here we go, road mapping using the, the TOGAF standard. So road mapping itself um, is something that I've seen, of course, many of our organizations wanting to use, um, the various customers that we work with whether that's from universities, finance, nonprofits, everyone I speak to wants a roadmap. Um, and arguably it's because it provides some kind of element of direction of where they are headed. It's true whether those are technology roadmaps, business roadmaps, portfolio roadmaps, they are there to provide some kind of a direction, if you like, for the company, for project teams, um, or just for individual users within the organization as well. Enterprise architecture, I guess, has helped develop these types of roadmaps. Um, and it, as you can see at the bottom, hopefully providing some levels of assurance of risk management as well. Being able to understand where we are and where we want to get to um, becomes a fundamental part of those roadmaps. So there are a few different uses of these and certainly uses that we've seen um, across organizations. Um, so certainly for, let's say, financial institutions, um, we've seen these used for regulatory compliance. Um, a, few, a few years back when standards like MIFID II came in, um, organizations wanted to make sure that they could be compliant. And certainly when the standard um, became a standard, that they actually were compliant. So these roadmaps provide a really effective way of doing that. Um, the key thing there is usually it's some level of um, scoring that you might apply to roadmaps as well. I mean, we're 80% compliant today. We want to be 85% in the next 12 months. So it's those types of situations that they become quite useful. Also for things like um, M&As, so mergers and acquisitions, especially when organizations are trying to adopt technologies from who they're merging from or acquiring from, these roadmaps provide a really nice formal and standardized way of actually managing those timeframes as well. You can see a few other, um, let's say, use cases or drivers on here as well. Um, but I think pretty much everyone on the call would, would hopefully have some, um, let's say, experience of, of producing roadmaps or wanting to produce roadmaps. Um, it's certainly what we hear most of the time when we speak to our customers. So what does a standard actually do and, and why would we actually use a standard? Well, hopefully by definition of its name, it does provide a good standardized way of producing content um, a lot of the time. So from our perspective, what this really means is we can have pre-configured content. So we can actually have um, example roadmaps, example dashboards, example reports of maybe what good looks like for different industries and different organizations as well. A lot of these frameworks, and specifically, of course, TOGAF in this case, also provides um, a method. You know, if we look at something like the ADM, we can see where there are aspects of that particular standard where we can build those roadmaps and apply those. So the methodology of how to do something is also a part of those standards. The meta model itself, and what we might classify as a meta model, is essentially the list of components, so the objects and then the connections, the relationships between those objects. Um, and that's really the fundamental aspects when we start producing roadmaps. Typically, 
if we think of technology roadmaps and product roadmaps and business roadmaps, they all use aspects from that meta model. But also, let's say generic EA roadmaps, we arguably want some kind of slice through the entire architecture as well. What processes do we have? Which applications support those? What infrastructure is in place? What regulations are they abiding by? That's really where the meta model can help define the aspects of your roadmap as well. And finally, like we've mentioned already, the templates and notations, the style of the views that you create, the style of the roadmaps that you produce. We'll touch on this a bit more towards the end, um, but it's certainly a key aspect of those frameworks. Now, it's not just limited to the open group frameworks, of course, as much as this is an open group WebEx, um, you likely want to combine these with other areas as well. And um, hence the tool support that we have, we're relatively agnostic of standards. Our ability is to support them um, and obviously then combining them with other notations if needed. Um, we do have experts on the call, which, which isn't me, um, who can tell you a bit more in terms of the certification process. So hopefully we'll get some questions at the end about this. But you can see how quickly TOGAF, of course, is being adopted worldwide. And these stats are maybe a couple of years old now. Um, but you can see the influence it has. You can see, again, why it's become a standard. And you can also see why users are actually using this across the world. OK, it actually produces some really good outputs and deliverables. It's a good methodology to adopt, even if you're just starting off in the EA world. And you can see that there's a huge community and resource to access. Um, and that's, I would arguably say, one of the, the key or fundamental things of thinking of standards and frameworks is, is there a community, an audience you can reach out to, a body that you can speak to, to actually ask your questions and get some answers in return? Clearly, you can see that obviously TOGAF is, is right up there as one of those. Now, TOGAF itself, when we think about roadmaps, and we can also think of this as almost different business scenarios as well. Now, quite often, when we see customers building roadmaps, it can be for different points in time. So a roadmap typically has a time element to it. Um, but really, we think of these as different business scenarios and different roadmaps to achieve those. So again, TOGAF, of course, has elements that um, contribute towards this, where we first look at the three aspects of building business scenarios. We gather the information, we analyze that, and then ideally we kind of review and, and collaborate on that content as well. So these are typical phases to remember when you are looking to build roadmaps using something like TOGAF. But what really is a roadmap? Well, I guess the first thing we can think of is a definition. And um, so, of course, the TOGAF um, standard does have a definition for what a roadmap is. But from reality, of course, what this really means is we're looking at change over time. Now, this could be months, it could be years. It could also be across the lifespan of different projects or programs that you're running. And of course, from an enterprise architecture perspective, it usually incorporates different aspects like people, processes and technology as well. Now, you can, of course, get these specialized roadmaps, technology ones, architecture ones. Again, usually they're, they're kind of sub parts of the overall architectural landscape. And again, of course, if you're going to be using something like the TOGAF standard, you typically will be splitting those up potentially um, into those business scenarios. Now, when we do actually think from a standard perspective, and um, we can think of the terminology that's used in here. So when we think of things like work package portfolios and um, typically maybe projects and programs that we're working on, we might try to assess and review those. So what kind of business value do they bring? Maybe what risk is associated to those? But this is a fundamental part of why we would produce a roadmap in the first place to actually get a view of those. So you can take this kind of matrix based approach um, to actually analyze some of the projects and programs that you have and then use that as an input for your roadmaps, uh, but also from an output perspective as well. Now, I mentioned um, we're agnostic of frameworks technically from a tool perspective um, in terms of Abacus's tool set, um, but certainly the way we typically think of this, and maybe this is the, the practical side of what we've seen from our experience, is we typically split these roadmaps into four different styles, if you like. So this type one in here is typically what we would have as a tagging approach. 
So if we heat map our diagrams, our views, the suggestion in there for what we're actually using as a heat map, uh, maybe something like a time concept. Um, so tolerate, invest, migrate, eliminate, or any other kind of classification system you're using, just to understand um, what's being changed. Type two is usually more of a, uh, let's say, traditional time aspect where there's a, a time scale. Um, there's life cycle dates we're thinking of. We're also thinking of when this change is going to happen. Type three incorporates more of those work packages, projects and programs, and some of the interdependencies across the model. Okay, so producing application roadmaps, typically maybe type one or type two. Type three then is actually the connections across the model. If we're retiring applications, which processes, capabilities, and infrastructure does that affect? So it's using that EA model and then spanning across the organization. Um, and type four, the final type in here, is what we classify as multiple architectures, going back to TOGAF as a business scenario concept, where we actually want to build potentially trade off views for the multiple states that we're modeling. Dive into a few examples of what these look like later on. But think of these as the four types. And arguably over time, maybe there's a data maturity aspect to which type you want to produce and also on the audience you're producing that for as well. So again, those standards become really useful. And of course, the idea is to reuse those standards. We're not actually reinventing the wheel and we can actually maximize the value of the data that's there. Maximizing the value of that data um, is, of course, one of the, the fundamental parts of the, the kind of concepts they work with on customers. When we think of roadmaps, um, we typically think that it does require a lot of data. And arguably, you do want that as close to real time as possible. Um, so again, maximizing the value of your data from this perspective is sharing the content you produce, um, leveraging automation, so bringing data into tools or into to any kind of portfolio you're using, and then making sure that there is, let's say, real-time views. You know, if you're producing a roadmap for the next six months, you want to be using the best available data and not data that's maybe two or three years old. And then, of course, some of the fundamental elements of a roadmap, which I think uh, are relatively evident from, from what we've said so far. Um, but roadmaps typically start off from where you are. Um, typically, you want to then be at a certain point or reach a certain destination. And then really what we're trying to do through those roadmaps um, is explain how we actually get there and why we actually want to get there. The why becomes, again, a really important aspect of roadmaps. And we don't necessarily want to produce them for the sake of producing them. There has to be some fundamental goal at the end. Are we trying to reach a level of compliance? We want to reduce our application costs. Are we looking to redevelop our processes? There's usually a why to those types of roadmaps as well. Now, I've mentioned it does typically require a lot of data. Um, and there are things, of course, that we can do to help streamline that. The key thing is actually um, managing this in chunks, let's say. So we, we can break down what aspects from a roadmap we actually need to produce. Realistically, for most organizations, it does mean getting multiple teams involved. And of course, that means then sharing the data and building more modular architecture areas um, so that each team can actually work on the area that they are responsible for. So we can petition the architecture. TOGAF has some really good examples of how to do this, whether we go for breadth or depth, depending on the roadmaps we're producing, making sure that we focus on the expertise within the organization. And most importantly, that everyone's actually working at the same time on this content and that we're not working in separate disparate tools. Okay, so certainly I've seen from my experience silo data sets, which I guess we can cross our fingers come together in the end, uh, rarely happens. Um, you do need to make sure that there is some kind of single source that you can trust um, and then hopefully a single deliverable and output from that source as well. A quick example, um, maybe for what I mean by typical automated views and the, the kind of life cycle stages I mentioned for type two roadmaps. This is really the kind of life cycle stages we think about. Um, start dates, end dates, end of vendor support, 
you know, this is where we can actually build, dare I say, more traditional road mapping approaches. Gantt style views is, is typically what people think of when we say road maps. Um, like I said, it doesn't always have to be, but this can be one of the first things that we actually achieve um, from using any tool, really. And then there's the aspect of um, what we've called no code algorithms. So roadmaps require a lot of data. Um, typically, we can automate that as much as we can. And one of the ways to actually automate that is to leverage, let's say, formulas or no code based algorithms. What that means from a practical perspective is all of the different types of components that we're modeling within the architecture applications, capabilities, infrastructure, processes, all have sets of attributes that we want to manage. So whether these are business fits and technical fit scores, and the criticality of our systems, the cost of our systems, we want to leverage some of the no code capabilities of tools. And that's because we want to actually dive into some of the insights from that data. Okay, so algorithms really can provide a way of predicting some of the future states, even without you actually producing them manually. Specifically, when we think about application landscapes, that can become quite important. If we want to try and predict what our costs are going to be in the next six months, predict the complexity increases from an M&A, these are where these no-code algorithms become really useful. The outputs from these can also dictate the roadmap. You know, if we're running an algorithm that determines the availability of our services is relatively low or the reliability of our services is re uh, relatively low, that can hopefully then, um, let's say, kick off a, a project to produce roadmaps for remedying those types of situations as well. When I looked at those four types, um, I also mentioned a type four, which is these multiple architectures. Um, from a I'm going to say traditional EA sense, um, a diagramming capability um, format, let's say. What we really think about here are things like current states and future states. Okay, so if you've used things like Argmate, for example, you, you might recognize these as plateaus and business scenarios in TOGAF. But the idea is that we have some kind of baseline model, and then we actually want to produce some target states. And you can see this, of course, with the ADM in phase B as well. We're actually trying to understand what we could look like through these different scenarios. They don't always have to be end states either. And keep in mind, these could actually be transition states, phases of a project. They certainly can be target states, um, but they also could be those um, interim phases that we actually go to to reach those scenarios. Later on, um, I'll touch on a bit more around the trade-off of why we actually model different scenarios. But from a practical perspective, these are maybe views that you're currently producing, certainly as much as it's on anonymized data in here, certainly views that some of our customers are producing um, for building current states and target states as well. So road mapping, um, hopefully we've covered in a bit of detail there. Again, we'll, we'll jump onto some of the other topics later on, on some of the details. But another fundamental aspect that we've seen um, as a practical guide for EAs and certainly one of the trends we've seen um, is around technical debt. And we've provided extensive WebExes before on technical debt. Um, but I think TOGAF has a really nice um, quote within their standard in here, which is today's digital products, um, inevitably in my case, and I've seen, um, do become tomorrow's technical debt. Now, technical debt itself um, stems from a few different areas. I mean, originally, of course, more from a software perspective where we have um, maybe refactoring code, if we actually look purely from a software perspective where the terminology came from, um, that's important in most organizations. Where maybe kind of the, the terminology to be more kind of enterprise debt or architectural debt. Um, certainly if you search within the TOGAF standard, you'll find um, almost exactly the same terminology, of course. But the idea is that debt follows throughout the entire organization. Um, <clears throat> certainly from an EA perspective, we're not just focusing on software in this case, and we are focusing on the architecture as a whole. Most of the time, it's not necessarily the case um, that it's, it's a bad thing to have technical debt. 
So we've grouped this into what we call reasonable and negligent debt. For a lot of the products we build, a lot of the projects we run, reasonable debt typically falls into maybe where we have time constraints. And we will issue some waivers now to push a product out because we realize the benefits outweigh the time and cost it would take to fix immediately. Sometimes there's a need for debt because we do have plans to refactor things later on as well. Okay, so this is typically what we might call reasonable debt. Now, negligent, of course, is the stuff we want to avoid, hopefully. Um, Short-term patches to products that we know aren't ready for release, um, poorly integrated systems and services, and hopefully stuff we avoid the most. But we, the lack of planning can typically fall into negligent debt as well. Stuff which I realize in practice isn't easy to avoid, um, but sometimes it's good to realize that, of course, not all tech debt that we build up is necessarily a case of bad planning. It could just because we know we have plans in the future to refactor something, for example. Um, there was an interesting stat here as well. 25% you know, of the overall development time is dedicated to managing technical debt. Um, and that arguably is because we've historically tried to push products out and projects out um, so quickly to hit market first that we've accepted the overall cost that it's going to take to fix in the future. Again, I've said it's not always a bad thing. The bad thing about technical debt generally is that it's typically invisible. So most EAs hopefully like some kind of classification framework. Um, this one's actually from Philippe Critchen. But this particular one is useful. Um, so you can see here the, the kind of features that we might roll out as part of products are typically um, visible to users and organizations and stakeholders um, and arguably should provide positive value, whereas the bugs usually visible, um, but do obviously provide negative value. Um, I think the architecture one hopefully is a bit unfair these days. It certainly maybe was this case, um, but architecture provides very positive value to organizations arguably is a bit more invisible um, to the wider team. And of course, tech debt falling to negative value and invisible. So, so the worst really of, of where we can actually land. Interestingly though, you know, some of the kind of content we produce from a tech debt perspective is actually visible to certain teams. Um, and we'll see a quick view of that later as well, of who's actually aware of where tech debt sits. Another good classification framework, just to show you, is this, um, let's say, time on a trade-off of time, cost, and quality? Okay, so most of the time when we're producing content and building products, let's say, um, there's a trade-off. And typically, if we think of um, pushing quality down, that's because we want to do something very quickly, um, and also we want to reduce the costs. The other side of that is actually we want to do something very slowly or very quickly and there's a compromise then to be made on cost and quality and then finally of course we have this expensive approach you know we have to be doing something very quickly it has to be of high quality unlikely that trade-off means it's going to be relatively expensive most organizations hopefully want to find some kind of balance here and between these three metrics but inevitably there are going to be trade-offs and in certain situations, you do want to push one boundary more than the other, depending on the product you're working on. Oftentimes, um, I'm going to say time is the thing that we can control least often, <laughs> especially if we think of things like technology roadmaps, um, end of vendor support dates, for example, relatively fixed. Um, so we do potentially have a good amount of time to fix that. But the nearer it gets, the more we might actually have to push those costs up to do those things quickly as well. Now, again, I mentioned earlier on technical debt came originally from a software background and certainly from what I've seen, that's not the area that we want to focus on from an organization perspective. We actually want to find ways of classifying um, and measuring technical debt in arguably a more business centric way. So the questions you can see on the right hand side, uh, the typical kind of, I almost think of those are the, the Pillars and Zachman. Um, but really things like what applications do we use and what technologies do they use? And that's a fundamental part of classifying technical debt initially. If applications are using out-of-support technologies, 
if they're using um, unsupported technologies from an organizational perspective, where we have preferred ones that we should be using, that can contribute to the overall tech debt score. And then if we want to identify who the owners are, so we can actually collaborate on this. And the why, of course, is important here as well. You know, we have to make business decisions, not necessarily technology decisions. Business should drive technology decisions ultimately. So classifying um, and measuring technical debt um, becomes um, incredibly important as well. The impact of that can then lead into things like higher level cost metrics or security or risk. You know, certainly the conversations I have with certain stakeholders, when we talk about technical debt, we talk about the implications, regardless of how in-depth and technical we might get from an architecture perspective. We really want to convey the fact that there is going to be a cost implication if we don't fix something now. Or there's a higher risk to the services and data that we hold if we don't fix something now. So it's about trying to maybe translate some of the more of the technical terms up to a high level business um, deliverable outcome. Um, and typically cost drives most decisions. Um, so cost is arguably a good place to start. This is quickly just coming back to the um, no code based approaches I talked about earlier on. So again, algorithms are going to be really useful in this situation. You know, if we have metrics up and down the model, we want to aggregate those as quickly as we can. We want to identify trends within the architecture. Um, so using algorithms becomes, again, you know, a very important aspect of building these types of um, technical debt scores, um, but also recommendations. You know, if we can have a tool that can analyze our application portfolio and can understand the um, criticality of our applications, the fact that using unsupported technologies, that tool, in this case Abacus, can then actually recommend what we should be doing. Should we invest in this product? Should we retire this product? Should we migrate to new services? Those are the types of areas the tool should help. Of course, they're not silver bullets. It requires data, it requires input from architects, but those algorithms can help shape some of those decisions going on. Ultimately, it comes back to who actually cares about this stuff. Um, so earlier on, I mentioned, of course, people within your organization are aware of technical debt. Um, and maybe unsurprisingly, it's people on the front line, the delivery teams, the EAs. The difficulty is then working back towards something like senior management, who potentially are very unaware of technical debt. They may be aware that costs are increasing in certain areas and risks are increasing but it might not always be tied back to tech debt or enterprise debt. So again, part of why we'd actually want to work within something like a tool and part of why we'd actually want to use a standard like TOGAF is to make sure that we have everyone in the organization involved. If you look through the standard, of course, there's mentions of enterprise architects, but there's mention of every other team within the organization. I and mean, you can actually see that within 10th edition as well. If you look at the series guys that have been introduced from, from that perspective, security architecture, project architecture, process architecture, it's the wider team being involved that can actually help deliver these results. And it's not just a focus on the EA team anymore. Um, and arguably, you know, the EA team have those capabilities within there, but it's making sure that the wider org audience um, is aware of the work that's going on and of course, then aware of some of the outputs that are being delivered as well. So that comes to really um, the next phase, which is we have the data, we potentially produce some roadmaps, and we have an idea of how we're classifying measuring technical debt, and we can see why it's important. We can also see who we actually need to convince now to reduce tech debt. So really that's about raising awareness across the organization. So action and ownership um, is a key aspect. An area which I don't think gets as much emphasis, um, or maybe certainly hasn't, it definitely has these days from the customers we've worked with, but action and ownership means actually motivating people to actually see the work that's going on. Okay. Now, from an EA perspective, um, or from any team perspective, really, the availability of the data is one of the first things. So do we have the data? Yes. How are we making that visible to the rest of the organization? You know, are we leveraging existing tools that are in use? Are we you know, trying to develop our own tools? 
the key thing is actually centralizing a lot of that data. Ownership means that people are going to be more aware of their own content. Ownership means that people can feel a bit more comfortable reaching out to the wider team to ask questions about the products and projects they're building. Okay. And it also allows us to actually track some of the content that we're building as well. I mean, even here you can see, even if we're within a tool like Abacus, you want to be able to integrate this with tools that your end users are using. Teams, Confluence, Slack, SharePoint. Make this data available in those areas so that we can then reuse it as architects within our own EA tool for planning and road mapping, et cetera. The other key aspect is actually having um, a bit more of a focus on certain metrics. Um, some of these slides we produced before has you know, lists of hundreds of metrics that we, we want to, to focus on potentially. And, and we always ask the question, which ones do you want to focus on? Um, most of the time we get the answer of all of them. We all want to reduce costs, we want to increase efficiency, we want to make our services better and quicker. The problem is that we can't do all of those things at once. And certainly the pitfalls or the quick failures I've seen is maybe an overemphasis on perfecting a model or trying to implement too much too quickly. So my recommendation usually is find the focus initially. Again, you know, costs comes up every time, but really the focus could be on specific products or programs that you're running right now. Your focus could be on a specific use case. Internally, we want to reduce tech debt or internally we are working on a cloud migration project. So focusing on those areas becomes um, fundamental for a successful EA implementation, in, in my opinion. And then finally, from a, a communication perspective, um, it's actually trying to make that data available through things like interactive dashboards. PowerPoint slides, PDFs are also okay, but realistically you want near real-time data um, and your audience wants a bit more of a self-service environment. So it's making sure that they can access that content, they can review, they can provide feedback, and then they can also feel like they're actually interacting with that content. This also has the, the other effect of if you ask someone for information, they usually want something in return. So if you're asking someone for which applications they use, which processes they support, um, it's nice that they can actually dive into a dashboard and see the outcome from content that they're actually um, delivering um, to you as an architect as well. And if we combine both of the things we've talked about so far, so road mapping, technical debt reduction, um, a few quick things to mention in terms of how we've actually managed this across our organization and across our customers' organizations as well. Stuff you've already seen so far, but again, just re-emphasizing, life cycles and Gantt charts become really useful for this. Because when we actually roadmap tech debt, there has to be a level of reduction over time. We can't just say we want to you know, eliminate this because... One of the issues you will find is you'll always keep consistent scores of how you're reducing tech debt, but maybe not clear visibility on the new applications that are being spun up. The new infrastructure that's involved, new capabilities you're, you're building internally, that can be invisible tech debt that you don't see because you're focused on a specific area. So making sure it's actually available, making sure you can actually trace that throughout the entire architecture this end-to-end -end ecosystem, if you like, um, becomes really important. The other thing is coming back to that tagging approach. Right now, you might be in a situation where maybe there isn't a clear plan of exactly how you're going to reduce tech debt or when. So it's important to just start with that tagging approach. You know, what do we actually want to, to start with? Should we start with those applications that could be moved to cloud? Should we just start with those applications that are highly critical? Or should we just start with those applications that maybe actually don't have that many users, so the impact of migration will be less? There are different avenues that you can go down here, um, but certainly this initial tagging approach is my first recommendation if there's nothing in place, um, rather than the big bang approach of a full end-to-end -end roadmap. And then also, the trade-off scenarios. So I mentioned this earlier on through the diagrams that we produced, where maybe we have target states, current states, and baselines. Uh, from an architectural perspective, 
Um, they're great, of course, because architects want to, to build and model things. Um, now, arguably, those are the, the details that are important for specific teams. For stakeholders, displaying Archimate diagrams, BPMN diagrams, TOGAF content is sometimes more useful for the architects. What you also want to keep in mind is when you produce those views, there is a stakeholder outcome, let's say, which is within one of those target states, or if we have multiple target states, there's the trade-off of what we're actually trying to achieve. You know, we're producing those states because we want to potentially reduce cost. Now, by reducing cost, we might increase our risk. If we're trying to be more efficient, we might reduce our complexity, but then we might also increase our costs. So that trade-off is also very important, um, even more so for tech debt, of course. You can, we can all reduce our tech debt quite quickly, but I guarantee the costs will, will skyrocket and that won't be an improved project. Um, so there is a trade-off to be had, coming back to that balance we mentioned earlier on. You want to make sure that your, your stakeholders are actually aware of what you're trying to do, not from maybe an architectural detail perspective, but from a higher level metric perspective. Um, so having multiple architectures, having multiple roadmaps helps you achieve those areas as well. Now, communication is also key in this case. And I've talked about raising awareness and how we can actually do that. Um, but there are four aspects that we find um, to how we actually communicate some of the outputs from the architecture team. So the first is awareness. We have to be aware of who we're actually communicating to. What role do they play in the organization? And that will help dictate the context of the views that we produce. Then there's, of course, a more of a, a story that we have to tell. We have to take our users on a bit more of a journey in terms of how we actually teach them the content we've built. And the story obviously has to be compelling, you know, especially, I think, in tech debt situation, um, building a compelling story of why technical debt should be reduced is half the battle, I think. Um, and that, again, is coming back to context and awareness. Who is the stakeholder? They likely want to see some more metrics around cost and risk and compliance rather than the technical details around how that started at the start. And then finally, empathy. Um, obviously, understanding what the challenges are for those stakeholders, what their priorities are. Not everyone's going to be interested in what we're interested in. So it has to be an organization change, let's say. Um, and the insights and deliverables that we produce have to fall to the right level as well. A key aspect, and um, which you've seen hopefully throughout all of these slides so far and a lot of the examples, is around the visualization of the data that we have. I've mentioned Gantt charts and diagrams and different graphical ways we can display the content. But really the reason for that is to actually make sense of the data and then to easily then be able to communicate that throughout the organization. A quick example of, of why we actually need that. Um, and I think it's important to know why. I think certainly sometimes we think, well, you know, a PowerPoint slide is fine or an Excel sheet I can understand, so surely someone else can understand it. Um, that's not always the case. Um, so certainly in certain situations, um, why we need data visualization becomes really important. So in this example, um, there's a whole bunch of numbers in here. And, and, and typically uh, the question I would say was, well, how many times does the number nine appear? Now it's relatively difficult to do that quickly, but it is easy to do. Now, as architects, what we actually want to do is make arguably the invisible visible. So what as architects we need to do from a data visualization perspective is make that easier for our consumers. We can start highlighting these numbers. We can make it even more obvious by highlighting them even further. And arguably the easiest approach is just to have a count of how many times that number appears. But this falls into more practical examples as well. If you think of a table that just shows the cost of services over the next five years, I can see that certain services increase and decrease over the time. Tables aren't the best way to represent this information. Um, and we've provided extensive WebExes before, um, purely on data visualization masterclasses, so I won't, I won't spend too long on this topic. Um, but it's, a, it's an important part to think of. Architecture teams may draw diagrams of this, 
We can actually see our services as components and have almost like a traffic light system. But again, it depends on the audience because some users actually want to see um, arguably better trends within those services. So if we actually build charts from those, we can be even more specific and focus on one single service and see how those costs are reducing over the years. That's a better approach than using the table. It's pretty rudimentary, let's say, um, exercise or example. Um, but inevitably over the past 21 years of us doing this, we've seen um, how effective communication actually works within organizations. There's arguably much better response from all the stakeholders involved. Having the, those visualizations means that we can actually make decisions much quicker um, and much better decisions because we're working off more real time and consistent data. And also it gives us better control of that situation. If we have multiple Excel spreadsheets, multiple PowerPoints and visual diagrams, and there isn't really maybe confidence in the outputs we're delivering, um, that really doesn't help the EA team in general. And therefore for the next project, there's less confidence again. So at the beginning for certain teams, building the confidence in the team that's delivering these results, it does come from that effective communication aspect. So how does that relate back to TOGAF? Well, typically, even if we focus on a single phase within TOGAF in here, um, aspects of this come back to the initial vision phase, if you like, but really you want to actually start establishing how we actually want to build the work um, within an EA tool or within your organization. So just actually taking TOGAF as a framework, as a, as a good place to start and identifying what you want to focus on, defining the scope for that. So when we talk about things like technical debt reduction, do we focus on specific metrics? How far in the future do we actually want to model this? And also who's going to be involved? You know, identify which stakeholders we want to build the content for, and then the deliverables we have to produce at the end as well. So that's just a single phase within, within the ADM. But of course, if you incorporate all of those phases um, within any type of project, um, it becomes even more useful. One thing I would say is from a dashboarding perspective and also just from a, a pure TOGAF perspective, um, my experience of using it varies from customers who are new to EA who want to use TOGAF and those who have been in the EA game for, for many years who already have something like TOGAF as an established framework within their organization or an established standard. And what I would focus on at the beginning is taking a look through some of the series guides that they have in terms of how you can focus on specific architectural domains. But also more importantly, um, I would also treat TOGAF as a bit more of a, a toolbox, let's say. And, and you've heard this before, I think as well, but that's a really important aspect of its usefulness. Use the parts that are necessary for the projects that you're working on or for the architectures that you're working on. If you sit down and say, I want to implement the entirety of TOGAF, um, it, that's not necessarily going to work. If you treat it as a bit more of a toolbox, if you search for terms within TOGAF, you'll find a few hits if you search for technical debt, for example, or if you search for agile architectures, that framework is supporting each of those areas in their own right with just enough architecture, let's say. Okay, so treat aspects from TOGAF as fundamentals to, to actually what you want to build within your teams. And this example here you're seeing is really just how it can then be used across a wider audience. You know, dashboards, Gantt charts, graph views, these are all aspects that tools can then support with the addition of those frameworks. So frameworks and standards have their, their practical uses within organizations. Um, I'm biased for saying the tool will also help deliver some of that work. And that's why we support things like standards like TOGAF um, and many more of the open group as well. Um, so certainly they provide a really good accelerator, but certainly obviously from our perspective, we think a tool can even um, help even further to, to standardize um, and provide a single source of truth as well. So hopefully from a, from a TOGAF perspective, maybe from a general EA perspective, that gives you some context of, of um, what we do, some examples of how it can be useful for road mapping and technical debt. Um, if you have any specific um, queries on other types of work we've done with the open group and how we've actually used Abacus across other frameworks and notations, 
um, feel free to reach out as well. 